like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of some boy's life. Because we're talking movies, we're talking boyhood, starring Heller Coltrane, Patricia Arquette, and Ethan Hawke, written and directed by Richard Lackner. So Chris, I spent half my life acquiring all this shit, and now I'm spending half the second half getting rid of it. You know, I actually almost didn't write a quote for this just because this is like, this is a pretty heavy movie and I almost felt like it would kind of undercut the film to just have this like random quote. But I actually think I found one that makes a little bit of sense considering both you and I are parents. We're going to play a little game called The Game of Silence. Whoever can stay quiet for the longest period of time wins. Hey, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of How'd You Like That Movie? Tonight, we're going to be talking about the Linklater epic. I mean, you can't explain it really any other way. 2014, Boyhood. Scott, do your thing. Take us away. Listen, I'm, this is going to be the one time I'm, I'm, I'm going to be happy that I get to go first because I'm going to assume there's going to be this long... Wait, isn't don't you always go first with your wife? Yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's all about me and you. <laughs> but it's a race. I win. Yay! <laughs> but, That's the most uh, joyful. Actually, I'll be honest. Considering how heavy this movie is, like those those statements do not fit with the fucking show we're about to review. But go ahead. <laughs> well, what I was gonna say is, I, I'm assuming there's gonna be a long fucking monologue from you. You like not just like how it normally is, but. I'm assuming it's all going to be about the runtime uh, and, you know, how long this movie is. And Which what is you're substantive. Gonna it, it, so I'm assuming that's going to take a while. So I'm glad I'm going to fucking talk first. And I think just the sheer amount of commitment that went on in this production is fucking la- like legendary. Like I am still in awe that this film was produced and made. For the oh, amount 100%. of time, hundred percent. The amount of time that it went, right? The thing you're talking, you're talking, about, you're talking about like production schedule and like shooting schedule, right? Right. In reality, this movie was only shot for forty five days, but it was shot from two thousand and two to two thousand and thirteen, right? I've got, I've got two thousand one, but I mean, still, like, I mean, over two, three years, kind of thing. Two, two, three years. It was twelve. No, it was shot. I have in my notes that it was shot from 2001 to 2003, so over two, two to three years. It not was two times four. Or I don't know how you got 12 years out of that, but I know math's not your fucking strong suit. So, okay, let's let's just you know, I'm not I'm not math, but let's, let's just let's do let's this. split the difference. Let's we'll just call it two well, and a half. no, no. I'm just gonna bring it. I'm just gonna bring it here. Um, so the star of the movie, you know, Eller Coltrane, was seven when the movie first started filming and 19 when the movie finished so by my math 19 minus 7 is 12 are are you sure they didn't have younger actors for the earlier scenes it's the same people it's literally the same cast over a 12 year span uh you know what man like we're we're live uh we may want to we want to verify that because i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure about that fucking statement that's the whole fucking, this movie was going to be called 12 Years, but then wasn't because of 12 Years a Slave. <laughs> oh, shit. You know what? You're 100% right. That's fucking crazy. What fucking movie did you watch? <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to choose that. First off, by the way, uh, we're recording this on Sunday late in the night. And uh, Chris, actually, I think our entire production crew, including Scott and I, have already started drinking. So this show may make fucking zero sense. I mean, I think that's going to be at least in the first uh, example of Scott schooling me on notes. Uh, so cheers. Cheers to that, Scott. <laughs> like, all you had to do is put a one in front of your two, right? <laughs> but Touché. yeah, like, like, lit- like in reality, yes, it was 45 days of shoot, but it was over a 12 year span where they would film two or three days over the 12 years like in terms of runtime each 14 minutes of film is a year in in this kid's life and in terms of script right it didn't really come with a full script obviously um but what richard did was he he had 
technically the story beats he wanted for each character. And then before refilming the next year, they would watch the year prior and kind of go on to that, right? And then just kind of fill in the story here. I mean, Linklater took a lot of input from the actors, which I mean, makes sense. It's a pretty organic script. So anyway, go on. Yeah, like in terms of Ethan Hawke's character, like he based it on his father, like being a risk assessment um, person for an insurance uh, insurance company. Patricia Arquette based her character off of her mom, who later on in years went back, got an education, and became like a psychiatrist or something. Fucking like who that. is this guy doing his deep dive into the fucking film? Jesus, I'm not, I'm on a pod, the wrong podcast right now. Listen, I I don't always show up. It's because of this. But fu- when you don't, I do. <laughs> it's because, well, I mean, I'm good. It's good that we're a team. Uh, I mean, I guess that's why it's because this is about a family. You were like, I gotta fucking know everything about this. This is the most. This is the no, most no. family movie. It's it's a movie about family, but it's not a family movie. You know what I mean? No, like in, in terms of what got me interested and wanted to deep dive this is just in terms of this production, like actually having this 12 year span, like the amount of, like I said, the amount of commitment, like each actor had to commit because he couldn't, he couldn't sign these people on a contract for this movie because of the, the law in the States where you can only sign up somebody, I believe it's for seven years. Right. And this was almost double. So we just had to have faith that they would be like, we would work around their schedule and that they would commit. Um, imagine like three quarters through this, Ethan Hawke's going to go fuck your hat. You're like, you got to like replace the dude with like three kids in a trench coat and well, like a bad if, mustache. If you wanted, if you wanted an example of that, that actually almost happened. Um, the girl who plays Samantha, like the sister. You mean his daughter? His daughter. Halfway little, through this, she lost little, interest. Uh, oh, I thought it was because of her cocaine charge. <laughs> no, no. She she lost interest in this halfway through filming in which she was just like, just fucking kill me off. <laughs> right, and then he's like, "No, that's way too dark for the kind of story I'm trying to tell." Right? Listen, you either like, go, you go and be in my film and finish it, or no college for you and you're out of the house. Like, what does that fucking family dynamic dynamic in the link letter well, look like? If you, you, if you think about it, she's the one that like was begging him as a child to be in the film, right? So. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he sat her down and like, okay, listen, like this is 12 years. Like you have to commit kind of thing. It's not just a flash in the pan. Do you like being rich? Do you like living in this big fucking house? That's Go be in daddy's. Yeah. Like, like for me, that's what, that's what's that's blown my mind with this film. Right. Is just in terms of just the production itself. Right. And I like how, um, the amount of commitment that had to be made but not just in terms of staff but like 12 years is a lot in terms of technology like he went with 35 millimeter film and he literally had to keep that going for 12 years too right so yeah you can't suddenly switch the fucking i mean you could i mean there's tech nerds out there that'd be like wow you know what you do is you take the film and you like transpose it but i mean like you're not going to switch over right like you got to fucking keep shooting Exactly. So that's the thing, right? Like every little thing had to be like miraculously researched and detailed, right? Like in terms of what you start as them as kids in terms of their fashion senses, like you kind of have to keep that continuity going, right? So I actually, one of the things I really like about this film. So, I mean, we don't normally do like big summaries on the show, but essentially like you watch a family over 12 years like you watch, like it you you will move from one scene to another and the children are now like five years older and stuff so it's just just to give the our, our listeners a bit of context um but what i really the, go ahead go ahead i was gonna say that's the thing that i like like this movie never really talked down to the audience right like right. it wasn't it, it was never like oh here's 1992 oh now and here's 19 like six we'll years it. later and yeah what i love about the way they did that it was with the off, music and the pop culture references, right? They just pop culture references, like you know, he's playing a Game Boy. Well, it's not a Game Boy; it's a type of Game Boy. And then he's playing an Xbox, right? Like the hairstyles change, the music, the music. cues, yeah. the music's right. Like you know what time period it is because there's certain things that are happening, or references to 9/11, or whatever. But like you said, they don't they don't tell the audience 
they just give you the information and they're like, if you really care to know what time period it is, you can fucking look it up. Um, yeah, and you go you from really their cell know... phones. You have the old flip, Motorola Razor flip to all of a sudden that he's one of the first FaceTimers with his dad, right? And it's all like static. He's not really working that well kind of thing. And right? they make reference to like, oh, well, you can send an email. So, you know, yeah. kind of like where your starting point is. And they don't even talk about the kids' ages that much. Every once in a while, it's like, oh, I'm 15 or I'm this and that. But like, it was, man, yeah, this film was really, really, really well done. And, you know, I just want to talk about, you know, so it's got, a, you know, obviously it's got a 97% from critics. I'm like, yeah, I can see that. It's got, a, well, I can't remember what we said about Mean Girls, its audience rating. This has an 80% audience. So the fucking people that went and watched this movie liked it. But let's even talk about like the kind of numbers you seem to care about most of the time. They made this on $5 million budget. It did 58 fucking million dollars box office. Like that is amazing. This is like, I don't know. I don't want to call it an art film, although it is. It's Mm -hmm. kind of experimental. It's very indie. Um, I mean, the note I gave myself is it's like, well, actually I'm going to segue into the sex. So my, my quote this week is from uh, Chris, Nashawati from Entertainment Weekly, and he says, "Like Michael Apted in his Seven Up documentary series, which if you haven't seen the Seven Up series, it's super cool. I mean, it's a documentary, and they do the same kind of thing. They follow people through it. Anyway, like Michael Apted in his Seven Up documentary series, Linkletter makes you feel as if you're watching a photograph as it develops in a dark room. And the note I gave myself is, or home movies, it's got a very cinema verite feeling, like almost like." It's not documentary. You know it's not documentary. It's it's a drama. It's scripted. But you get this feeling of just, like, watching things happen. And, like, you know, it's funny that, yeah, you would think that I would talk about pacing. And it is long. And it feels long. But I think that's okay. Like, I don't – I don't think you can cut anything else. Because, like, look, and this is going to be, like, one of these, like, philosophical fucking Zen Buddhist kind of statements. But, I mean, like, life is not drama all the time. Sometimes life is just normal. Sometimes life is just you talking with your parents in a kitchen over like a regular conversation. And this film has that. Like, I can't even imagine how much film they actually shot and then edited it down to this because it feels seamless. Like it just, it's organic and it grows and it's fucking heavy. Um, Yeah, like this is a very serious movie without being serious. It talks a lot about, it sh- it shows you a lot about life without telling you. It just is. And I, I know I'm not fucking saying a lot and I'm not really selling this movie, but it's just got this gravitas weight to it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I think in terms of, okay, so the movie is titled Boyhood, right? But this movie could have been titled Fatherhood. This movie could have been titled Motherhood, right? Like you have each person and in terms of the circle everything's from uh mason jr's point of view like his his uh preferred right or whatever the fucking word i was trying to say point of view uh, per perspective or whatever and yeah they even and and what i do just before you move on to that they use pov in a great way like they don't rely on it all the time but like the camera angles like as the children are when, when they're younger and stuff like that you get that power imbalance, right? Like the adults, you're seeing like a true POV. The adults are much bigger and stuff like that. Or you see the way food is laid out and stuff. And that POV changes as they get older. And like, you really get a sense of being inside the actor's skin or sorry, the character's skin. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and what I got out of this is really like all we have in this life is this life, right? You have the choices and the moments you have. So you can either be able to get seized by a moment or you can just let it pass you by right and i think i think the line in the, and actually fuck i can't believe i didn't use this as a quote it's like people keep talking about seizing the day but really or seizing the moment but really the, the moment, moment seizes you seizes you yeah smoke my big bong <laughs> no but here here's the thing right like while watching this film uh, like my wife was watching it with me and She's not into these kind of artistic movies, right? She she likes her rom-coms. She likes her straight comedies. Like, anything that kind of makes you think, 
unfortunately she doesn't like right and the whole she asked well me, i mean she has to think a lot every day about marrying you so i mean that's a lot of thought process yeah she was like <laughs> fucking thank god it happened thank god she's like i'm Your fucking married just gets, gets, gets like chopped up on the show she's like i'm married to a fucking podcaster listen our podcast is this movie it's so indie <laughs> like people don't even know but once they do know they're like fuck this is awesome right <laughs> but what i was gonna say is she asked me like what was the point of that movie and i couldn't answer it until the end right and and the point is like this is life right like if you're if the next if this film had one last scene and it was literally Eller Coltrane as an 80 year old man on his deathbed and you're literally just watching him relive his life in which it was the moment that made him and developed him and that made him be who he was like it would have made the same amount of sense as this right and, and actually i'm glad they didn't because i think that would have been tacky and cheesy and like like i, I get where you're going but, but yeah like, if man, you think that, about it like that when he's, up, go ahead go ahead go ahead i was gonna say when he's moving out at the end right and his mom breaks down and saying like you know what do i have now like all we have are these we had these moments and now the next moment's like my death and he's right? like yo that's like you just like jumped ahead 40 years <laughs> right but if you think about it like every everything that was chosen in terms of you, you saw right it, it was moments that made him right the things that he remembers most so when that's why I think you never really saw him as a child when Ethan Hawke and Patricia Arquette were actually fighting. together. Or right? fighting or anything. Yeah, because it's like the memory of a child only kind of kicks in at a certain point, right? Right. And the daughter who is older, but in real in real life, they're only three months older, but um, she's like, that's all I remember was you guys constantly fighting at each other. Right. Man, that that line was so and especially like because the dad's retort is like yeah but what about camping and this and she's like no i like i just remember like the fighting the fighting okay. like that is such a powerful statement you know what i mean like we could talk about like the sociological and psychological aspects of this film like like i said it's very very heavy uh i mean it did it did like i said it did it did well uh financially like i said 58 million i, I can't believe it did so great in uh in box office but i mean it got six oscar nominations unfortunately like whiplash and uh, a couple other like really big films the like birdman know, is the and one birdman yeah more. did better at the oscars but patricia arquette got her an oscar for her uh like best supporting role uh it got five at bafta nods, nods and two wins and i believe P patricia arquette was one of those as well like it did really well and like you said like this is like not the kind of film you think was like people were going to like both critics and the audience was going to like it's two hours and 45 minutes long and I've, as i've already stated it feels it like it's not do not watch this movie to just be entertained because it is going to make you think it is going to and and i think no matter what your life is like whether you had that kind of life or maybe your parents stay together all the time like they hit on so much of what, like you said, what life is, what family is, what like just what being a sibling is. Like, you know, your 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 sibling wakes you up, throws the thing at you, you throw it back, the parents come in, the, the sister starts crying, just fucking blames it on. I have a sister. She made me do a podcast on fucking mean girls. Like she has done those things. I was also <laughs> a tyrant brother, you know what I mean? Like, um, those kids, those kids are my nephews. I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna like you know, decide, say who's who in that thing. But if my sister watches this film and listens to this podcast, she's going to know exactly who's who in the zoo on that. So like, it's so fucking real, man. It's such a real movie. But yeah. And, and I think, yeah, I was going to say like, and like going back to that last scene when she's moving out, you, you realize how much was skipped in terms of it. Like when she starts talking about, remember the time we thought you were dyslexic and you're like, that wasn't in the movie. Right. Like you're going back to him as a kid and, and they're talking about all the other things that kind of went on in that family. Um, 
and it just like kind of skips over and you're like it like this this film does make you question like if i have to do if i have to make a comparison and i know this is probably going to get beef and people are going to call me stupid but i would say this film this film is this generation's citizen kane that it's beautiful to look at it has a story and it makes you question what you saw so other than i don't i actually don't 100 percent disagree with you the only thing that citizen kane has over this is the filmmaking techniques used in citizen kane this doesn't do a lot of like really groundbreaking uh cinematography or whatever like it, it's it's, it's it, a pretty it, that- straightforward linear format uh, shot like you said, shot on thirty-five millimeter film. No crazy. No, no, I like, get what writing. you're saying. Like in terms of in terms of the cinematography, like the tech, right? The tech side, right? The only person that's going to do this again is Richard Licker. And if I, if I'm not mistaken, like, and I could be, I think his next movie is a twenty-year span that he's right now shooting a film that is going to take twenty years to finish. Like, and if, if this film was 12 years and he was fucking telling Ethan Hawke, like, if I die, you got to finish this movie, <laughs> right? Imagine whoever's in his next movie, what he's telling that guy or that girl, right? Like, well, he works with Ethan Hawke a lot. Like, so this is, uh, and of course it was, it was written, he? directed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Written, directed, I, produced. I think um, he only did two movies with Ethan Hawke. So he's, first off, he has an entire trilogy. The, um... It's before sunset, before sunrise, and before midnight. All three of those. That's Ethan Hawke. It's the same kind of thing. He seems to like this. Yes, kind of yes, like... Th- that is Ethan Hawke. But at no point is that Richard Lick- Lickler. What are you talking about? He fucking re- wrote, produced, and directed those. Oh, I don't know if he produced it. He wrote and directed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I mean, it's also interesting that like, so he, but he also. This is the same guy that did Dazed and Confused, which is a fucking amazing movie. And I understand Ethan Hawke is not in it. Um, yeah, he was in that movie. Ethan Hawke is not in, in Dazed and Confused? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. He's in The Newton Boys. I po- Jesus. I apologize. Okay, so I apologize. Scott, Scott gets me like at the beginning of the fucking show, and in like three sentences, I fucking cut his entrails out. So are you not entertained podcast listeners? Uh, and he also did Scanner Darkly, which is super fucking dark. Um <laughs> Which uh, I mean, he's a he's a very interesting writer and director. He he, he tends to write and direct a lot of his own stuff. Um, he, uh, he yeah, like he did a fantastic job with this stuff. Like I said, I mean, the whole uh, before sunset, before sunrise. I haven't seen all three, so I don't want to co- comment on it. But it actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a note to myself when I'm done watching that trilogy. It actually might be a perfect trilogy because the first two are very very good i haven't seen before midnight yet so um but you know what i noticed on this is that i thought was super interesting when i was watching the credits is that they used two directors of photography there are two cinematographers on this which i'm like i don't know too many films that have two cinematographers working on it and i don't know if it's because of the time frame maybe they're just like I'm, i can't i can't fucking commit to that shit um so the first one is Lee Daniel, who, again, so he worked with him. He's the cinematographer for Dazed and Confused. Uh, he did Before Sunset and Before Sunrise, but not Before Midnight. And then you got Shane Kelly, who did a Scanner Darkly. So he has worked with both these people before. But have you seen a Scanner Darkly? Uh, it's been a long, long time yeah. since I've So you know it. it's like kind of like animated, weird. Yeah. Like, it's like so- motion cap and not motion cap. Yeah. So you got a cinematographer that does that in Kelly – but then you've got Lee Daniels, who's like a traditional cinematographer. And somehow I almost want to go, I almost want to know like what fucking shots were done by who, you know what I mean? Like, like if I go back and watch this, which I'm not going to right now because it's fucking long, but like, can I pick out, can I pick out or like, were, were they working simultaneously or did like, were they doing like pickup shots? Like how the fuck did you structure that artistic vision from your DOP? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I get it. Like, I think, and I think you're right. Like, I think it could be because of the time frame too, right? Like, I know if you think about it, while this was getting made, what, a year or two after? Like, when it first started, year or two after, that's when Patricia Arquette started in that medium show, right? Yep. So she's filming that show. And I think 
each year she her scenes were just literally filmed on the weekend right because that was the only time she could actually come and yeah because tv's got a bit of a like i mean other than like when they're done shooting for the summer and stuff like that like tv depending on what kind of tv show you're shooting it's like bang 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 done next episode bang 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 right Mm -hmm. so yeah no one no one now my only complaint about this film is something to do with the plot okay and that is Patricia Arquette's um, journey, like her story points. Okay. Like, okay, so leaves Ethan Hawke because he. Well, they're young. You I think I think they were just young and young, just didn't work and, out, right? and something to do with alcohol too, because he he was kind of talking. Like at the end, he starts talking, right? And this was the part I didn't like. And then she the one guy came over and was like, I'm not responsible for your mistakes, right? So then she dumps him, they move to Houston. Mary's... Can you give us the short version of this, Scott? Come on. No, no, wait, wait. Mary's her professor, right? Yep. And, and oh, then he turned... Oh, spoiler alert, uh, alert there. Yeah, fuck everybody. Like, this movie's super old. <laughs> like, if you haven't it's watched this movie... It's not super old. It's not fucking Citizen Kane. Most people haven't seen that either. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. But I, I just say that Mary, Mary, like, dates her professor. Yeah. And then marries him. And then he ends up being an alcoholic and beats her. Yep. She then leaves and you never see the other two kids again, right? So you have no idea what the fuck happened to those guys. Then she becomes a professor. She dates her fucking student and then, and then like, marries her. To see you, Mrs. Robinson. You know what I mean? Right? She starts doing the younger guy thing, served in Afghanistan. Yeah, and then she she starts dating him and then he ends up being... A okay. drunk alcoholic. Sure. But the the thing I didn't like was when they have after the son and Ethan have that conversation about um him breaking up with his girlfriend, right? Because she fucked uh, a college There's a cross guy, player, right? Where Ethan technically put everything that bad that happened to that kid was the mom's fault for not sticking with him, and then the kid's like, so he goes, I turned into the person your mom wanted me to be 12 years 10 years ago it just took me time to do that and if she had patience he goes who knows what would have happened maybe we could have all been one family and then he goes I wouldn't have to have dealt with all those abusive drunk guys and he's like shrugs his shoulder like yeah like how do you put that on the fucking mom so are your parents together yes yeah so you don't know what the fuck you're talking about that's the what? type of shit. How do you put it on the mom? <laughs> because, buddy, that that's what makes that movie so fucking real. Is because like parents in divorce relationships and stuff like that. That type of shit is all the fucking time. Yeah, parents but if are you always, look, I, I, I would, hear, and I, they I, do it. And I'm gonna just fucking shut you right down right here right now. Because no, no, like, I would agree with you if they didn't have that relationship close to the end where they were talking to each other and they're like, "Hey, I want to help you out. Okay, I want to help you out. Thank you." For raising my kids the way you did you did an awesome job and then the next fucking scenes like your mom makes stupid choices but that's that's again that's that's what gives it a realism because like a character we can be written perfectly people have flaws people are not like they they could be become great parents and still be fucking assholes they can be still drunks and drug addicts and stuff like that like that when i watched that i was like yep Yep, that's exactly how that type of thing goes down. And, and it's actually, it, what it does is it shows it's like, he's cleaned this up, he's cleaned this up, but like, he's still human. It gave it such a human element. But I mean, go back to your perfect fucking life and who do you ask yourself in your beautiful house, you know, fucking talking heads. Uh, you don't know that band because you're young and you don't know old, cool indie mo- movies uh, or music. Um, <laughs> what do you think of casting? I thought the casting was perfect. I thought yeah. I thought it was great. I thought I thought it was perfect as well. Like, um, I mean, I I really like Patricia Arquette. Uh, you, I mean, True Romance. We've talked about it on our show. If you haven't heard our episode on True Romance, definitely go check mm-hmm. it out. Uh, you know, David Lynch's uh, Lost Highway. We talked about Ed Wood. She was in Ed Wood. We talked about that on our uh, Edward Scissorhands episode. Have you seen the Act yet? The TV show, The Act. It's a, It's actually more like a limited series. It's based on true events. No. Go watch it. Like it, it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, that looks fucking stupid. I watched, I watched the first episode, fucking binge watched it. 
It's based on true events. It's basically uh, based on this mom who convinces her daughter that she like needs like a stomach, like she can't eat, that she needs to be in a wheelchair and blah, blah. And it's all, I don't want to say it's bullshit, but uh, yeah. And then there's a murder and some fucking crazy shit. Uh, and Patricia Arquette plays the mom. It's fucking good. Go watch it. It's called The Act with Patricia Arquette. Go watch it. I'm pretty sure it's on Amazon, but I mean, go find it wherever you can find stuff. But like, you get to see her range. She does a fantastic job. And it was great because I watched The Act after we, I think, relatively close to when we did True Romance, where she's just playing like this hot sex bomb, you know, Tarantino character. And then you see like the evolution of the actor, right? Like it was great to like kind of bookend those things. I would actually suggest not only bookending those two movies, but bookending this episode and our episode on True Romance. So, you know, you want to check that out. <laughs> You're so <laughs> You're like, oh, shame so with self promotion in the old podcast. Look at that. Though. Look at that. Eh? <laughs> uh, what, what do you think of Ethan Hawke, though, is, as an actor in general? Like, do you have any films that you uh, particularly, particularly like him in? Of Ethan Hawke. Well, not any of the before sunset stuff, because I'll be honest, I haven't watched any of those. Check them out, man. They're they're actually they're super cool. But we like relationships and stuff like that. I mean, you like that type of thing, don't you? Yeah. Oh, I like the purge. Yeah, he was good in the purge. I mean, it's a kind of a two dimensional character. So no, fuck you. Everything <laughs> like anything that's good, you don't like anything that's like, oh, this is so auteur. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have you seen Sinister? That was fucking good. And that's like the most scares ever. Sinister is to... scary. Yep. I'm trying to think what else he was in. All right. Fucking, I'm what was the one? Some... No, no. Go what on, was the one on. with um, Jude Law and Uma? Okay. Gattaca. Yeah. Fucking amazing movie. Actually, I think Linklater works with Jude Law quite a bit too. Um, and then the other one, it, it's literally a movie that gave me fucking nightmares. And it, I think it's like the scariest movie ever made. Okay. Alive. Which one's that? It was based on the true story where it was like the rugby players and the pain crash in the mountains. And then they end up fucking oh, eating shit. each other. Yes. Yes. That's good. The <laughs> Ch- Chilean rugby team or whatever. And then they like eat each other's butts and stuff, but not in like a weird sex way, but in like a cannibal way. Yeah. Like they get, they get fucking, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, like they start fucking being cannibals to survive. That I was, yeah, I thought it was fucking scary as shit. Cause I, it, it, like, anytime I, I'm on a plane and I see mountains, I'm like, oh fuck, am I gonna have to eat a person? You just like look to your left and you look to your right and you're like, as long as I'm not the biggest person in my seat row, I'm not gonna be the one getting the eating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you miss Training Day. That is good. Yeah. Yeah, that is fantastic. Reality Bites too. That one was good. Reality Bites is good. I mean, that's early like Winona Ryder, who we talked about in our Edward Scissorhands episode. Uh, Dead Poets with Robin. Is he in Dead Poets Society? Yeah. Not, He's the main guy. He's the main student. I don't think so. Oh, my He's fucking in Great God. Expectation. You can look that shit up. Uh, I, I'm I like fucking... Him. Okay, I'm looking at her. Oh, oh, Dead Poets Society, Robin Williams, Ethan Hawke. Okay. Okay. That is there a fantastic film. Uh, I mean, we're almost like three for three on this one. So films that I actually really like him in is... So he plays Chet Baker, one of my favorite j- early jazz musicians in Born to be Blue super gritty kind of indie film uh if you like jazz if you like kind of that like or like uh indie cinema definitely check out born to be blue uh he's plays uh a character in a film called uh before the devil knows you're dead with uh philip seymour hoffman which again they it's fucking super dark super cool film though like again i I love film with philip seymour hoffman so like r.i.p to him um And then, yeah, we talked about training day and great expectations with, I mean, I think he dated Uma or not Uma Thurman. Um, Well, I think he dated Uma Thurman. He was married to her. He was married to her. Um, What's her name there? Goop. What's the Goop chick's name? Gwyneth Paltrow. I don't think. Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. In uh, Great Expectations. Uh, And Robert De Niro's in it as well. It's a great uh, adaptation of the the Shakespeare play. So check out, uh, check out those films. I do have one, one piece of trivia for you. Oh, do you? Yes. Do you know in this film, the Beatles Black Album? Yep. That's a real thing. That's a real he, thing? He actually made it for his daughter to help cope with his divorce from Uma Thurman. I want to watch that. I want to listen to that fucking album. The stuff He's talking about 
having like the best of like Paul McCartney and the best of George Harrison. And then like, even the way the fucking playlist is laid up, I'm like, okay, can someone just fucking make that album? Cause I want to buy that album. <laughs> uh, he's got like wings on there. And anyway, whatever. Um, I mean, I think I've really said my piece on this. It's good. I think you should watch this film. I think you should watch it not to be entertained, but because I think it's going to be kind of like, a carousel of life like it's it's gonna give you a real sense of like the philosophy of what it means to be alive and what it means to have relationships it's it's probably the deepest movie like obviously we talked about slavery with annabellum and stuff like that but again that was like a, a horror take on it this is a very very real film so uh i would recommend people watch this um if you want to think about something and you know what even break it up into some sections like i said it's almost three hours long Maybe like, you know, you watch him, you know, here to here and he gets to a certain age, take a break, come back, watch it again. Because the way they shoot it, you can just pick this motherfucker up. And that is our rant for the day. Please like and subscribe to this podcast. You can also reach us and interact with us on social media at how do you like that one or email us at how do you like that movie at gmail.com. Well, I mean, if okay, you... from now on, you are souls are only allowed to do com- films that you really care about, and you have to drink. And why was that a good show or what? Oh, fucking awesome! <laughs> I've got like a page and a half of quotes here to pull uh, media bites out of. So, uh, <laughs> for, for, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but that's our producer talking to us. Who uh, we we we've been recording like later on Sunday nights. Uh, none of us like doing this. Uh, all of us are drinking this episode. Uh, our producer actually hates it almost. I, he was saying earlier in the show that the, I don't know, Rod, why don't, Rod, why don't you tell us, why don't, why don't, if, in case the audience can hear you, what, what did you think about recording on a Sunday night? Uh, it sucks, totally, because I really have other things to do, like drink um, away my, the cares of my life on Sunday night, <laughs> and I got to <laughs> fucking record this podcast as much as I love it. It sucks to do it Sunday night. So that's what we do. That's 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 the commitment we give. Uh, I mean, you saw that Scott and I were both drinking during the show, and according to our producer, that's actually the fucking magic potion. So. <laughs> Production by Rod Shaver, Vader Monkey Productions.